Good morning. I'm Pastor Alexis Twido, and I want to welcome you to worship with us here at Advent Lutheran Church on this eighth Sunday after Pentecost. Today we will hear Jesus' words and teachings through the parables yet again. What is the kingdom of heaven like? Surely it must be so incomprehensible, so awe-inspiring, that Jesus had to describe it in countless different ways so that people could even fathom a sense of it. And after a month of sermons on the parables, I'm starting to wonder, what do you think? How do you understand the kingdom of heaven? How would you describe what it's like? Perhaps today we will unpack a bit more of the truth and the hiddenness of what the kingdom of heaven is like. During worship this morning, we will consecrate the bread and the wine, or juice, or water, God's body and blood, so that we may partake of this holy meal together. Now you are, have the opportunity to do that during our worship service, and that will happen after the prayers of intercession and the Lord's Prayer. And if you need to pause the video in order to gather your supplies, to gather your bread or crackers and your wine or grape juice or water, please feel free to do so. In addition to having communion offered during the worship service today, we also have to-go communion kits available over the weekend for anyone wishing to come and receive them. I will be present again this morning in in the church entranceway from 9 a.m. to 10.30 a.m. to offer a greeting, to, to offer a prayer or a blessing as you come and receive communion. So please stop by and say hello. Uh, we will encourage you to wear, social, to wear masks and to social distance if you do come. I also want to take a moment this morning to remind you, our friends, that even though our church building is closed for worship presently due to the pandemic, we are still very much active as a congregation and our ministry is still happening. The property committee continues to make improvements in our building every day. Member care is working on ways to connect with you best as a congregation right now. The prayer chain is still active and, and ready to support those who, who need a word of prayer. The staff support team is still working hard to put guidelines in place to hire new staff for the church. AA still meets in our space weekly for small group meetings. The youth are still meeting over Zoom regularly and VBS is still happening for our families uh, over a virtual forum. I ask you, as you think about all the things that are happening in the church, I, I ask you to consider giving to support the, the, the ministry of the church financially. Right now, um, many of you are mailing in your offerings and you are dropping them off at the church, so thank you. Others of you have signed up for online giving through Vanco. And again, for those of you doing that, thank you. But if you have not been able to make a gift uh, to provide a financial offering to the congregation recently, I ask you to prayerfully consider doing so. You can do that, again, by sending in your, your offering to the church, uh, or you can go online to our website at adventchurch.org. And at the top, there's an online giving tab, and, and you can follow the instructions there. As always, if you have any questions, you can contact us in the church office. But please continue to pray for the work in the ministry of this congregation and continue to support our ministries with your financial gifts today. Now I invite you to take a moment to center yourselves before we begin worship. And I invite you to please join with me in praying the prayer of the day, which you can find on your Celebrate insert, which was available, the link on our website. Let us pray. 
beloved and sovereign God, through the death and resurrection of your Son, you bring us into the kingdom of justice and mercy. By your Spirit, give us your wisdom, that we may treasure the life that comes from Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. And the people said, Amen. I invite you to turn to our psalm. Our psalm this morning comes from Psalm 119. You are welcome to uh, read aloud or to yourself as we, as we read this psalm together. Your decrees are wonderful, and therefore I obey them with all my heart. When your word is opened, it gives light. It gives understanding to the simple. I open my mouth and pant because I long for your commandments. Turn to me and be gracious to me as you always do to those who love your name. Order my footsteps in your word. Let no iniquity have dominion over me. Rescue me from those who oppress me and I will keep your commandments. Let your face shine upon your servant and teach me your statutes. My eyes shed streams of tears because people do not keep your teaching. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. I now invite you to turn with me to our gospel lesson for this morning. The Gospel reading comes from the 13th chapter of Matthew. Jesus put before them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed that someone took and sowed in his field. It is the smallest of all the seeds, but when it has grown, it is the greatest of shrubs and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and hid in with three measures of flour until all of it was leavened. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field which someone found and hid. Then in his joy he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls. On finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown into the sea and caught fish of every kind. When it was full, they drew it ashore, sat down, and put the good into baskets, but threw out the bad. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come out and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them into the furnace of fire, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Have you understood all this? They answered, yes. And Jesus said to them, therefore, every scribe, who has been trained for the kingdom of heaven is like the master of a household who brings out of his treasure what is new and what is old. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. I invite you now to please pray with me. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable and pleasing in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So all month long during July, we have been living in a parable universe. We have been looking at the many parables of Matthew chapter 13. We have learned that Jesus used these parables to invite people in to a new way of seeing the kingdom of God. In them, he uses common, mundane imagery from everyday life to communicate supernatural truths about the economy 
and about the nature of God. Which is why, at every turn, there is a twist in the plot where the parables defy the conventional wisdom because in the world of sin and brokenness in which we live, work, and play every day, we find that that is not how the kingdom of heaven works. The world we live in is imperfect, a world to imagine how the kingdom functions, which is why the surprises and the twists never take the story where we imagine that it will go. And thanks be to God for that. When Jesus told these parables, he began to break down the boundaries between the mundane and the supernatural, between the world as it is and the kingdom that God intends. Because the parables don't just describe the surprising nature of God, but they actually create the faith that brings forth the kingdom. You see, the parables create space in the hearer's hearts for God to take root anew that God's message of good news of the kingdom of heaven might take root. The parables allow us to enter into that world in new ways, not just describing faith, but creating it. And maybe that's because Jesus, the word of God incarnate, which became flesh, knew what 20th century British philosopher J.L. Austin knew and, and shared in his teachings, that words matter. See, words don't just simply describe things. Words make things happen. It's why at the beginning of creation in Genesis, when we hear how the world and all that we know became into existence, it said that God spoke and everything was created. Words matter. Not just descriptively, but creatively. Words are powerful. They evoke uh, feelings. They evoke experiences. When, when people say, I do, at the altar, those words create a new reality for that couple in love. When someone says, I love you, or I hate you, or I forgive you, I'm sorry. We not only hear those words, we feel the force that they exert on us. Those words create and evoke a response in us. They change our reality. When racial slurs are shouted at people, they're not just ugly, uncouth words, but they create an environment of hate, an experience of unwelcome and danger for those for whom the words are intended. Words create a reality. Words do things. It's why I think one of the worst things we ever tell children, the biggest lie, is that sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Words are powerful. They do damage in ways we can never see or imagine but they can also build and lift up in ways we could only dream of. Words are powerful. And so it is for the word and the words of God. So Jesus uses these parables that we've been hearing about all month, not just to tell people about God, not just to describe what the world is like when God is in control, but to actually evoke some element of God's in-breaking reign and reality into the lives of his hearers. When they hear these words, perhaps the kingdom of heaven comes alive for them. Perhaps they know more deeply that these words are from God for them. 
I wonder, could they feel the difference between the ways of the world and the ways of God? Did they finally understand a bit of the uncanny and surprising nature of God? Did the hearing of Jesus' words create a reality in which the disciples were able to know and experience the good news more deeply. Words matter. Words create. They do something. So let's look at Jesus' words craftily put together in these parables, just a few of the parables today. Jesus says, The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed that grows into the greatest of trees which houses the birds of the air. It's like a bit of yeast added to a bunch of flour that leavens the whole batch. It's like a hidden treasure or pearl that someone sells everything they have in order to buy. Seems simple, clear. And for those who might not have ears to hear, who might be dull of heart, if we ended without digging deeper into these words, they might just be quippy little proverbs for us. Meaning things like, sometimes big things have small beginnings, or don't judge a book by its cover, or all that matters are those things of great worth and value in our lives. But for those of us who have ears to hear, who are really listening, the parables offer so much more. For one, as in true Jesus fashion, these parables are not as simple as they seem at first glance. There are twists, of course, every time, because our world is not the same as the kingdom. There are Uh, imperfect ways for us to describe. So we have to live in the twists and the surprises. Neither mustard seed nor yeast were considered good or beautiful or advantageous. And selling everything for a pearl or a hidden treasure would seem foolish. To the first parable, mustard. Mustard was another weed. Jesus loves preaching about the weeds. Mustard was a weed dreaded by farmers in the way that today's gardeners might dread crabgrass or buckthorn or bindweed. It starts out small, but before long, it takes over your entire field. And neither does mustard seed grow into a magnificent tree when it's full grown. At their best, and I mean at their very best, the scraggly mustard bushes may grow 8 to 10 feet but they are far from the greatest of trees. And yet it is the symbol of God's dominion. So what would this parable evoke in the hearer? What reality is created in these words? The kingdom of heaven is like a place where God's word of grace, peace, hope, forgiveness, and love can take root and then grow like a weed. And the result is a kingdom, a community of welcome. Maybe not in the most majestic, magnificent, or greatest of packages, but rather what seems to be true again and again is that our God blesses that which is humble and yet good for service. God blesses the meek. God blesses the strange God blesses the poor. Similarly, in the next parable, yeast was not something that people uh, associated with good and definitely not with holy. When we think of yeast, when I think of yeast, I think of those little packets you buy in the store and you add them to your dough in order to make your bread nice and fluffy when you, when you bake it, right? It's nice, it's clean, it's effective, um, it's, it's very easy. That is not what we're talking about here at all. Um, what, what Jesus is talking about is leaven, which is a rotting, molding lump of bread. 
And here in the parable, a woman takes this rotting lump of bread and adds it to, although the Greek here implies that she actually hides it. She takes this lump of moldy bread and she hides it in tons of flour and it infects all of it. Impure and a bit disgusting, leaven or yeast, as Jesus refers to it, was therefore a symbol of contamination, of corruption. And when mentioned in the Bible, it almost always represents the nature of sin loose in the world. So what do these words evoke for our hearers today? What reality are they creating for you and for me? When the disciples hear the kingdom described this way, what did it do to and for them? Did it help them understand the grace of God? Help them feel redeemed? That in them, which, that which is corrupted can be transformed into something amazing and wonderful and life-giving? Or maybe this parable invoked in them a sense of the hiddenness and the unexpected means of God's will and work in the world. And maybe it might have caused them to hope and to dream about what God could do in other secret and hidden places in unexpected ways. And then with the pearl and the treasure, who would sell everything they have for one small pearl or for a hidden treasure? But perhaps in hearing these parables, the disciples would have experienced a sense of the awesomeness of God's love and mercy that nothing else matters. When you find the kind of love and welcome that you find in God's embrace, that's it. It's all you need. Jesus' parables describe the kingdom of heaven in vivid ways uses those day-to-day -day images that would have evoked and created a sense of curiosity, an experience of connectedness, of, of wonder. So I wondered how people might think of writing parables today. I asked a few friends to share some of their own modern-day parables of how they would describe the kingdom of heaven. Vivid expressions of faith that illuminate who God is to them, how they see God operating in the world, and what the kingdom of heaven looks like from where they're sitting. From them, I heard that the kingdom of heaven is like a soaking rain after a long, hot, dry spell. I heard that the kingdom of heaven is like a bottle of Coca-Cola, refreshing, satisfying, invigorating that it is like waves crashing into the shoreline along the lake at sunrise, a new day of creation in motion. I heard that the kingdom of heaven is like a DeWalt toolbox for every nut and bolt as you work on your car engine, that it is like an orchestra where all the instruments work together in perfect harmony to create beautiful music that would otherwise sound poor if any instrument were missing. The kingdom of heaven, they said, is like the antiques road show where you are surprised that your junk becomes more valuable than you could have ever imagined. And they said that the kingdom of heaven is like an active compost pile which takes the crap of life and after a little heat and some stirring and turning over becomes life-giving nourishment for others. How would you describe the kingdom of heaven? How would you describe the faith that is active in your heart, the ways that God is working and redeeming in this world? How would you describe the hope that is promised for us, the love of God in your life, can you feel in your bones what it means when God gets involved in your life and in your world? 
Do you have a testimony that you can share about how the word of God creates something in you? What parables might you offer? Jesus' parables remind us that the faith we preach and the kingdom we announce isn't just an idea, but rather it's an experience an experience of the creative and redemptive power of God that continues to change lives. So may you continue to find new ways of making the kingdom of heaven come alive. May you share your witness of what God's word has done in your life. May you take care with the words that you speak that they might evoke life and grace and peace for others. And may you have ears to hear the witness of your brothers and sisters who share the kingdom message with you. For the kingdom of heaven is like a community that never tires from hearing a good story with a happy ending. Thanks be to God. Amen. I now invite you to come over to the altar with me and join me in a time of prayer. You can find the prayers of intercession located in your Celebrate insert. We pray. Confident of your care and helped by the Holy Spirit, we pray for the church, the world, and all who are in need. Merciful God, your reign is revealed to us in common things, a mustard shrub, a woman baking bread, a fishing net. Help your church witness to the surprising yet common ways you encounter us in daily life. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. When your word is opened, it gives light and understanding. Increase our understanding and awe of your creation. Guide the work of scientists and researchers. Treasuring the earth, may we live as grateful and healing caretakers of our home. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. As the birds of the air nest in branches of trees, gather the nations of the world into the welcoming shade of your merciful reign. Direct leaders of all nations to build trust with each other and walk in the ways of peace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Your spirit helps us in our weakness and intercedes for the saints according to your will. Help us when we do not know how to pray. Give comfort to the dying, refuge to the weary, justice to those who are oppressed, and healing to the sick. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You show steadfast love and direct us to ask of you what we need. Help this congregation ask boldly for what is most needed. Refresh us with new dreams of being your people in this place and time. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. From the silence of your homes as you are gathered, I invite you to pray any other prayers of intercession that you may have. Where you are, you can speak them aloud or quiet, quietly to yourself, but we will take a moment of silence for your personal prayers. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. In you, our lives are never lost. Strengthen us by the inspiring witness of your people in all times and places. 
Embolden our witness now and one day. Gather us with all your saints in light. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Ensure and certain hope that nothing can separate us from your love. We offer these prayers to you through Jesus Christ our Lord. And the people said amen. It is now time for us to gather for a holy meal. And as I prepare the elements for communion, I invite you in your homes to do the same. Gather the elements, the bread and wine, or grape juice, or water. And as I say the Eucharistic prayer, consecrating the elements, you may hold your hands over the elements in an act of reverence of, uh, and receive the blessing over the bread and wine, or juice, or water. After the words of institution and the Lord's Prayer, you will be invited then to partake of the communion, and you may then also share it with those uh, in your home with you. When you do so, whether to yourself or to those in your home, as you give the bread, please share the words, the body of Christ given for you. And then when you share the wine or grape juice or water, please share the words, the blood of Christ shed for you. After we have all communed, I will speak a prayer of thanksgiving and offer a final blessing. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread. He gave thanks and he gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup. He blessed it and he gave thanks and he gave it for all to drink, saying, this cup is the new covenant, the new promise in my blood, and it is shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this in remembrance of me. For as often as we eat of this bread and we drink of this cup, we remember Christ's promise to be with us always to the end of the age. And so we give thanks for the way that Christ shows up now and always. Amen. I invite you now to join us in saying the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Friends, this is Christ's table. And no matter where you are this morning, we are all welcome to this table of, of mercy and grace. So come, for it is ready. Welcomed at this wide table of mercy where Christ is the host, you may eat and drink and receive the blessing of Christ's body and blood. The body of Christ given for me and the blood of Christ. Now may the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. God of the welcome table, in this meal we have feasted on your goodness and have been united by your presence among us from all the ends of the earth. Empower us to go forth sustained by these gifts that we may share your neighborly love with all through Jesus Christ, the giver of abundant life. And the people said amen. And now receive this blessing. Neither death nor life 
nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. God, the creator, Christ, the, Jesus, the Christ, and Holy Spirit, the comforter, bless you now and keep you in eternal love. Before we go, I want to invite you again to um, turn to a song that I've selected for our worship today. You can go into YouTube and you can search for the hymn entitled, Fill Thou My Life, O Lord My God, by Horatius Bonar, B-O-N-A-R. When you search for that song, you will encounter this old Christian hymn uh, that invites us to give thanks for the ways that God fills our lives with all good things. So listen to this song and, and imagine the ways that God's word has created amazing goodness in our world and in our lives. Let those with ears hear now go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.